I think we can go ahead and get started because um, we have a lot to cover today. So um, hello everyone, my name is Morgan. I work at Bywater Solutions, of course, and um, I am here today to talk to you about configuring your catalog. So this is gonna be all about some more advanced uh, configurations that you can do related to your catalog display. So, you know, how it looks, how the data is presented, um, your search facets, and some other things that maybe you either missed during implementation or it's been a long time. So this is a, a great review for you. So some of you may be more familiar with some things and less others, um, but we're gonna cover a lot. So let me go ahead and start sharing my screen. And Cal is here with me today to help field the chat and help me out with any questions and things. So, so glad that she is here. Um, if you need the agenda for today, of course, the Aspen Academy is on the Help Center under Resources. So I'm just going to pull this up. The agenda is here. So hopefully you've had time to take a look at that. And Cal just posted in the chat. <laughs> um, so take a look at that. Make sure that you have the correct permissions. We have the documentation down here. So we'll be going through everything and trying to get through it all. So I'm going to start out by talking about a couple of different ways that you can customize the, the types of search on your catalog. Um, so a lot of them, you don't really need to do any additional setup. It's just a matter of adding that integration. So for example, once you add events, um, that's going to automatically show there. Um, same with, you know, EBSCOhost or EBSCO EDS. Um, a lot of those things will show by default once you get them plugged in. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit more about some options around uh, your lists and the combined result search, because some libraries use it, um, some libraries haven't implemented yet or may not, but I want to talk about both of those things. Um, so for the lists, those options are in Aspen administration. Let me bump up the screen size here. It's in library system settings. So by default, once you start making lists, um, especially if you already have the New York Times integrated into Aspen, the list search will just show right up. But you do have options to disable that if you ever needed to, um, as well as um, customize, this is especially of interest to consortium, um, customize what lists show on what catalog. So if I come down to the list section, or not, sorry, the, the list, not the list section, um, the searching section. So this public list to include section here, um, there is documentation, of course, on the Help Center, which I'm going to pop that into the chat. Um, and it explains what all these options do. So let me just pull that up on the screen so we can take a look together. So no lists, obviously, no lists will show on your catalog. If you didn't want any at all, that's what you would choose. Um, this list from this library. So the names of them are a little uh, not self-evident, but these descriptions clear it up. So if you select list from this library, it's going to be all lists that are public that were created by someone from that library. So in a consortia where all the different libraries have their own catalogs, it would just be lists from those library staff and it would not include the New York Times bestsellers list. So if you wanted the above, but you do want the New York Times bestsellers list, um, you would want the list from list publishers only. Um, list from all list publishers, I believe that's the default. Um, so that's going to include everything from everyone everywhere. Um, and then all lists is only lists that have been made searchable. So I'm going to show you some examples um, with a consortia. So if I pull up the main consortial interface for WILD, um, so this is not specific to any library. This is just for the whole consortia. Um, if I search in lists, you can see that it's bringing up lists from all staff, which, you know, it's the consortial page. So you probably do want to feature um, all of those different lists there. Now, if I actually go to 
a specific library in the consortia and do the same list search. Um, so now you can see the difference here. I'm seeing the New York Times bestsellers, but I'm also just seeing, I'm on Teton's, Teton, Teton or Teton? I don't know. <laughs> I'm seeing their library staff's list and no one else's in the consortium. So not as super relevant to single library catalogs where you just have one server and one catalog on it, but definitely something of interest to consortia if you wanted to kind of change what displays on each catalog, that's where you go. So again, that's in library systems. Um, I think if you search for lists, that might narrow it down a little bit. It's actually in a section called searching. Oh, that doesn't help. <laughs> so if you go into library systems and go down to searching, it's public lists to include. Oh, Corey says Teton, Teton, Teton. I can't say it right, even though you're spelling it in front of me. <laughs> Teton, there we go. All right. Now, um, the other option I mentioned is enabling combined results. So a lot of times during implementation, um, especially at the, you know, few years ago, we were, we were setting up everyone with this and you had to opt out. Um, so it could be that maybe you disabled it during implementation and forgot about it or it was just never enabled to begin with. Um, so let's talk about the combined results. So if I switch the search from you know, the default to in combined results, that's going to give you a kind of a bento box style view of different search sources. So it kind of looks like this and it varies of course, depending on your search results and how, um, you know, what you have featured in your combined results. So the more things that you have integrated into Aspen, the cooler the combined results page looks. So you can see it's got catalog results, events. So I could see this, these top events or click to see all. Um, if, of course, I can actually search for something specific in there and that's going to bring up more relevant things. So you get to decide what's featured in what order, how many results show before you have to see the full results. So to get there, <laughs> thank you, Corey. I am gonna look that up. I'm gonna put that in my own personal tab so I can research it later. All right, so to set up the combined results for your catalog, you're gonna again go into Aspen Administration Settings. Um, that's also in Library System Settings. So I'll just edit that. I apologize, my computer is running slow because I have 500 tabs open, I guess. Um, editing the setting here. And then I think I can just type in combined results in the search for a property, and that's going to bring this section right up. So um, I'm going to drop documentation in here. That's a link to how to set this up, but I'm gonna show you as well. So in your library system settings, of course, you'll click to enable the combined results. Um, you get to choose what the label is in the dropdown. So default, you know, call it combined results, but you can call it something else. Um, you can even default to the combined results so that whenever someone comes to the catalog, it'll just be this by default, and then they would be searching everything. Um, and then they would have to switch to search in more specific places. Yes, sir. Yeah, a lot of library, uh, academic libraries do uh, choose to use the combined results, actually, because it's really highlighting all the different sources for their searches. So once you've enabled it, you'll be able to add your combined results section. So you would just click add new. The source column is where you select from whatever you have currently integrated. So, um, you know, this testing site has a lot of different things. So you may not see all these options here. It depends on what you have, which modules you have enabled and set up. So we have, you know, set up the catalog results, events, archives, website results, and lists. You get to decide in this column for number results, how many results display before they have to click to see the full results. Um, 
so yeah, it's it's very customizable. And you, if you want to reorganize them, it's just these you know drag and drop things here. So you'd be able to rearrange them however you like. So yeah, combined results. Even if you're not having it as your default search, it's kind of a nice little extra option to have available for patrons who you know like to wander around and, and poke at things. <laughs> so. Just one of those other ways that Aspen gets you to discover different things. I see some good comments in the chat. Wonderful. All right. Perfect. So let's go on to um, just switching gears a little bit. We're going to talk about grouped work display. So, um, of course, if it's been a while since you've looked at this, um, this may be of interest to you, but grouped work display is where we control a lot of the settings that um, relate to how records appear in the search results. So let's just pop that open. I'm going to go to grouped work display. Um, so you can have multiple grouped work display settings. If you only have one catalog, you probably only need one grouped work display setting because that's all that's you know going to show up. Um, with consortia, depending on your situation and what you want libraries to do, um, you know usually we start libraries off with you know one setting for your main shared consortial catalog, and then at least one other setting that applies to all the member library catalogs. Some consortia have decided that they want each library to be able to customize their own grouped work display settings. So on your instance, if you're a consortia administrator, you may see, you know, a different setting for each one of your libraries. Um, but that's kind of what's going on. It, it controls what shows up for each catalog. So it can, everyone can share one setting or everyone can have their own or a mix. It's, it's really customizable. So I'll just pop into this, um, just this public one here. And I'm not going to touch on every single setting because we do have a lot to cover today, um, but I'm going to call out some things of interest, uh, maybe some things that you never really understood or might be of interest now that you are settled into Aspen and want to think about different options for, for how to display things. So this first option right up here, uh, this sort owned editions first, um, that's typically, I think that's one that's selected by default. Um, so if you only have one catalog, like you're a single library system, um, that might be checked. And it doesn't really matter if it is for you because, you know, you already own everything in your library system on your catalog. Um, so the display is going to be the same regardless. Um, for consortia, though, um, that can be a little more impactful. So let me show you um, the difference between those. So I'm going to pull up a catalog from the Catamount Consortia, uh, Manchester Community Library in Vermont. So um, of course, since this is a consortia and I'm searching from this library's catalog, um, it is showing that library's available copies first in the search results, um, but that's not all because they have sort owned editions first checked in their settings. When I click sort uh, show editions, any edition or record where they own copies of, um, and as long as they're available, that's going to sort that above the others. So since I'm on Manchester's catalog and they have a copy, um, their record is showing first in the list of editions. So, you know, this one is the, I don't know what some of the other differences are, maybe paperback versus hardback, but this has 272 pages, this has 318. So if I pull this up on another catalog in the same consortium, just to compare the difference there. So they have a copy available too. So it's showing Brooks's available copy. When I click show editions now, you can see the 318 page record is at the top because they own a copy of this record. So 318 pages here, if I switch back 272 pages here. 
So there are a lot of other things that go into, you know, the order of how the records are sorted. I'm dropping a link to that in the chat. Um, and let me just pull it up too, so we can look at it together. Um, so it's talking about, you know, this is the sort of owned editions first. Um, other items follow a formula. So it's looking at, you know, the availability basically, because the copy or the record that's up at the top is when you place a hold, that's what users are going to place a hold on. So if I click this button, it's going to place a hold on the first record that's sorted here in the additions list. Um, so ultimately, you know, after sorting the owned editions first, it's looking at the availability. So holds ratio, um, you know, when it was published, popularity, if items are locally available or not. So it's trying to get you the most available record up there at the top. So those are some of the things that go into sorting it, but that will help your owned editions be at the top on your catalog for your users. All right. Um, let me pop open this search results section here. Um, I'm going to talk about the search tools. Um, once we enabled the search tools to be at the top of the search results, um, I can't remember exactly when that was introduced, maybe in early 2023 or 2022. Um, ever since then, we've defaulted to having everyone at the top. Um, if for some reason you still have your search tools at the very bottom of the screen, um, I just like to call this out because I think the search tools at the top looks very nice. So up here, um, it has search tools right over there. Um, before, you'd have to scroll all the way to the bottom, and then the search tools would be at the very you know, bottom of the page. So if you're in here and you're not seeing search tools at the top right of your catalog, um, definitely, you know, talk to, you know, either do this if you have the permissions to get in here for your libraries, um, or, you know, ask a consortia administrator if you don't have access um, and talk about maybe switching that to go to the top of the results. Um, I also want to call out, you know, of course, some of these things are a little more obvious, like these optional details. So if there's information that you uh, wish was displaying in the search results, um, additional information beyond the title and the author, that is, um, this is where you can configure that. Um, this setting, so what this does is, um, if you have any of these selected here, if you were to turn this on, that means all of those labels would still show in the search results with the copy information, even if that information wasn't present in the record. So it would just say unavailable, or I can't remember exactly what it says, um, but basically it would be showing, you know, kind of up here with the additional information. Um, so that, you know, if you did want those labels to show, I think this is an option, again, more academic libraries typically enable this just so that they know that this information is always available, even if it's not in the record. Um, by default, I believe that's off for everyone, but some libraries do turn that on. I also want to call out the always flag new titles. Um, so that's just another nice way for Aspen to help call out new materials in your catalog. Um, so I think it's great when libraries have it enabled. Let me show you an example. So this consortium just went live on Monday. So welcome to the Aspen Discovery community. Um, I love their theme. So when you have that always flag new titles on, that's going to put these little new flags on those covers. And it's adding that flag to any whatever has been added to your catalog within the last week. So this is one of those things where if you went through implementation, you know, years ago and, um, you know, you haven't been keeping up on the new developments as much, which, you know, how dare you? <laughs> it's not like you have anything else to do at the library, right? Um, so here is me telling you now um, that this is a great thing to enable to help call those out. 
It's especially nice um, when you do things like saved searches in the catalog. So if you were to save a search to your account um, and whenever new titles get added that come up for your saved search, that even more clearly calls out those new titles um, whenever your saved search has an update. So absolutely love having that enabled. I think it's just a nice way to call that out. Um, let's see here. This is another one that uh, was within the last year or so uh, showing covers for additions. So again, if you haven't enabled this or if you forgot what it did during implementation and just turned it off, um, I think it looks really awesome. So if I do a search for Pride and Prejudice never lets me down. So let me give that a try. Uh, let's see. So yeah, um, it's kind of does what it says on the tin. It's going to show covers for the different editions. Um, so this one doesn't have as many as I was hoping actually. Um, but if there are multiple editions, it will uh, be able to show you the cover. So that way, if you are grabbing something off the shelf, um, you, you're able to more easily identify the specific edition you're looking for. Yeah, and I see um, a question in the chat. This is a very good one to clarify about the new flags. Um, Ed is asking, can you define how long the new flag displays? No, you cannot define the period of time for the new flag. It's just a rolling seven day period. Um, there's a cron that runs. So on the eighth day, it will remove that flag. So yeah, not the first time we've had that question. So I wanted to make sure I called that out. Thank you for asking, Ed. All right, so yeah, I highly recommend turning that on. Um, I just think it looks really nice to see all the different editions covers displayed in the search results. So that's show covers for editions in here. The next section I wanna move on to is the search facets. So um, this is where you can do a few different things. Um, some of them may not be as impactful for consortia, or sorry, not be as impactful for single systems. So if you're just one library system with one catalog or a single library, um, for example, you're you're not going to have a separate local collection toggle just because you know the entire collection is your collection. Uh, but for consortia, it's very important to have that distinction between the entire collection and just the collection at your library. So if I go back to Manchester, you can see that here they have entire collection. And um, they're actually defaulting to their local collection first. So, you know, no matter what I search, if I change it up to dogs or hippos or whatever, um, I'm searching within Manchester's collection by default. And then I would have to purposefully click entire collection to expand that. Um, so I think we, we set everyone up by default to the entire collection. Um, I personally like that just because if I'm looking for a title, um, you know, if I really care if it's in a specific location, you know, I can narrow down to that. Um, and then, you know, but by default, I'm at least searching everything. So I don't have to wonder, you know, do can I get this title or not? Um, but, you know, some communities are different, especially, you know, smaller, more rural libraries, you know, maybe users are more frequently concerned with what is actually in their library. And then if they can't find it, you know, they're trained to go to the entire collection. So totally up to you and what's best for your community. But if you wanted to change the default toggle, that's where you could switch it from the entire collection to the local collection um, or something else. I, I don't know if I've ever seen anyone default it to just available or available online, but the options exist nonetheless. Um, and of course you can change the labels here. So if you wanted to change the entire collection label, um, you could, and some libraries have in fact. Um, some libraries also change, I see this more commonly um, for the available toggle, especially if a library is no longer including online materials in the available now toggle. Um, so for example, I know that Wild, um, let me pull their site up again. So they have changed their available now toggle from available now to say on shelf now because they are specifically excluding those online materials in that toggle. 
So that's one example of, you know, why you might want to change the label, um, especially if you are changing it from the default of including online materials, because then you could specify it's available on the shelf now or available in the library now. If you are, you know, keeping this check to include online materials in that available now tab, um, you know, you may not want to ch change it to say on shelf. So just just make sure that if you relabel this, you know, be aware of what you're doing here with those online materials. Um, some of these other options here, I want to explain what's going on. Um, this is, again, some more consortia stuff. Sorry, I know that a lot of this is heavy on consortia, but we, we love our consortia, so I want to explain what's going on. Um, unchecking or checking these may not really have much of an impact on single library catalogs just because, you know, you only have one collection, so everything is already yours. You own it. It's It's local. There are no stuff from other library systems included. But for consortia, um, let's talk about this one, this base availability on local toggles or local holdings only. Um, so I'm going to copy a diff the, some URLs here. And let's show you the difference. So I have a search here on Natrona County, another wild library. Um, so I have selected that on shelf now. And so that's just limiting to available items at, you know, Natrona. So that setting is called base availability toggle on local holdings. So that means when I filter by on shelf now, that's showing me just titles where Natrona owns a copy of it. So if I do the same search in a different catalog with, you know, on shelf now selected because I'm on Tetons now, or Teton, Tetons, <laughs> Teton, wow, continue to make fun of me, <laughs> please. So um, because I'm on their catalog, it's showing me titles where they own an available copy. <laughs> Thank you, Cal. So what that's saying is just base that availability toggle on that library's stuff. Teton. Okay, the first was right. All right. <laughs> and it's saved in for posterity in the courting. Yes. <laughs> oh, man. All right, so similarly, um, so if I were to uncheck that, like if I was wild and I unchecked that, that just means that when I click that on shelf now toggle, that would include anything that's available now across all their libraries. So some consortia may prefer that and some consortia may want it to just stick to their library's available stuff. Um, the same principle goes here for include all records in shelving facets. So what that does for consortia is if I had this checked, um, that means that if you had a shelf location facet, so here's their shelf location facet, um, that would be including values from all libraries holdings. Um, so we know that consortia, sometimes different libraries catalog things slightly differently. So if you had that enabled, that means that the shelf location facet could potentially include any shelf location from any items across your whole consortia. Um, if you do not have that checked, then that's going to keep it local to your library's shelf location values. So on the items that you own, those are the only shelf location values it's going to look at and show in those facets. So again, it, it just depends on what you want for your, your libraries, what you think makes sense for your patrons, um, on whether you want to include all values from everything or just limit it to the libraries, um, your library's materials. Um, and a very similar concept here, just the same thing except with the date added facets. 
So um, let me show you another example from Matrona and Teton. All right. I'm gonna paste in my search here for Matrona. There's Teton. Okay. So doing the same search, I'm, I'm doing a search for mystery, format category is books, added in the last month. So we're featuring things that are the added in the last. So those date added facets are just looking at the, the acquisition dates for this library's materials. So this search for new items sorted by date purchase is going to look different than a search on the other library's catalog because we're just looking at things that are on order for this library or things that have been purchased recently for this library. So again, if you wanted it to include all date added you know, data points from all materials across the entire consortium, you would want that checked. But otherwise, if you want it to be specific to the library catalog that you're on and their materials, you would uncheck that to not include all records in the date added facets. All right, and I see we are getting to the halfway point, so I'm gonna try to breeze through some rest of the stuff. All right, facet counts to show. Um, I wanted to call that out since, you know, that's another relatively newer thing within the last year-ish or so. Um, so you do have the ability to change the facet counts. So by facet counts, I mean, um, you know, when you're searching for something, whether it shows you how many results there are. So by default, Aspen is ordering these uh, options in, by the number of results that they bring back. Um, so it's showing the, the exact counts there. Um, but let me pull up a catalog that is hiding the facets just so I can show you the difference there. We're not hiding the facets, hiding the facet counts. Oh, well, <laughs> I thought they were hiding them the other day when I looked at it. <laughs> Maybe I was uh, hallucinating, question mark? Well, imagine if you will, that the numbers were not there. <laughs> that is what it would look like if you were hiding the facet counts. Uh, so apologies that I got my examples mixed up, um, but that's what that does. Um, I personally would recommend, you know, just showing the exact counts or showing no accounts, no accounts at all. Um, it's still going to, if you were hiding those counts, it would still show everything in the order of the number of results. So if detective and mystery fiction was the first, like it had the most results for the, my current search, um, that would still be at the top. So they would still be ordered that way. It just wouldn't have those numbers there. Uh, it would still always show the number of catalog search results up here in the breadcrumbs. You just wouldn't see the numbers on the side. Yeah, maybe I'm thinking of a different Lincoln. <laughs> I don't know. Whoops. All right. So let's keep going. Um, I want to show you something that is brand new. So if you haven't dabbled in this yet, um, I'm excited to show you. So this is format sorting. It was new in 2409. So um, what this does is, let me show you the difference here. So I'm going to bring up beta examples. All right, so look, let's look at the order of formats here. So by default, um, how it's been for ever until recently is the book format would always be at the top and then followed by all the other formats in alphabetical order. So you have audiobook, e-audiobook, Libby, it just goes on. Um, with this update in 2409, you can now choose how these are ordered. So if I pop over to this test library, so it's the same record in the same collection, but now um, we have book followed by large print and then everything else in alphabetical. Well, not even totally in alphabetical order. So you have the audiobook down there um, and large print is the second. So to 
make that happen and play around with it, um, you first have to create the format sorting setting. So, um, you know, you'll have a default setting, but you can create new ones. So if I go to the same section over here, catalog slash group works, you have a new option here called format sorting. So to make a new one, you would just, of course, click add new. And then um, let me click into the East library settings because that's where we customized it. So you'll get to arrange the order of formats by the format category. So we're going to talk a little bit more about format categories and where you can control that in a bit. But um, these are the main format categories and they control some different things um, like which bucket they get sorted into for these format category icons in the search results. Um, and they also can control, you know, what materials are able to group together, what records are able to group together. So when you load this in, um, it's going to display, you know, the default is sort them alphabetically with books first. So that's how it was already. Um, but if you want to do a custom sort, that's what you would switch it to. And then you are going to see all of the formats that you have that are sorted into the book category. So you'll be able to rearrange these. So I have moved large print to the top. Um, I could even, you know, put something else wacky to the top, like e audiobook. I don't know what that's going to do exactly, but let's let's see what happens. <laughs> so if I refresh this page, that is an immediate change. So it did not have to re-index anything. Ta-da! I love it when changes don't need a re-index, don't you? <laughs> so that's sorted that above the large print now. Oops, I'm gonna go back here. So yeah, you would just, you know, be able to set that by the category. So comics, you know, that's going to include, that could include books or it could, you know, have e-comics, graphic novels, manga, things like that. Um, movies has its own, music has its own, there's another. So yeah, definitely you can play around with that and see, see what you like, what makes sense. You have the power now <laughs> to organize those. All right, um, let's move on uh, to talking about facets now, because I want to make sure to talk about some of the configuration for facets. Um, so facets, of course, when I talk about facets, I'm talking about these on the left hand side of the search results or, you know, the additional options you have in the advanced search. So let's just recap facets if you haven't uh, done anything with them in a while. So you can see there's a lot of different options here. So just like the group work display settings, um, you can have one shared set. Oh, I don't know, Erin. Um, it looks like I'm still sharing my screen. Can anyone else see my screen? Hopefully. Yeah, you're showing off the group work facet. Um, okay. Okay, someone else says they settings. see it. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, maybe it's hidden somewhere, Erin, <laughs> on your desktop. All right, I'll continue here. Um, so group work facets, just like group work display settings, you can either have a shared facet setting for everyone. Um, you could have, you know, one setting for your main consortial catalog and then another setting for all your member libraries, or every member library could have their own set of facets to do with what they like. Um, so I am dropping into the chat in case you haven't looked at this ever or it's been a while. Uh, we do have definitions for all of the facets you know, what Aspen is looking at for each one. So um, let's just pop into one of these and take a look. So of course, um, you you have been set up, everyone gets set up with a default set of facets. Um, during implementation, you learn how to customize those. So um, depending on your bandwidth during implementation, maybe you spent a lot of time with this and maybe you didn't. Um, but basically, you can rearrange these or add new facets at any time. So if I wanted, you know, audience to be up here or, you know, move it back down, you can drag and drop them to move them. You can relabel them in the display name column. Um, and you can always click add new to add a new facet at the bottom. And there's 42 default facets. 
plus up to three custom facets, which I will touch on in just a second. So scrolling over, you have lots of options. Um, so you get to decide you know, whether it shows on the search results page, if it shows on advanced search. So some facets might make more or less sense to have in one place or the other or both. Like for example, I think having like the author on the advanced search page is a little weird. Um, just because, you know, it's just going to start by listing all the different authors, <laughs> you know, by by the number of results. Um, so it's just kind of a weird one to narrow down unless you've already done a search. Um, so ones like that, I like to disable them from advanced search personally. Uh, Multi-select just allows you to select more than one uh, option in a facet. So that's really good for, you know, things like shelf locations um, or maybe subjects, you know, facets like that. So can lock, um, this is a contentious setting, <laughs> depending on uh, your, you know, your staff and your, your patrons and what you think works best for them. Um, but if I go to the search results here, so let me make sure it's um, on for the formats, which I think it is here, I'll turn it on for the format facet. So when a facet is made lockable, um, if I were to, so like, let's say I'm a patron who only ever wants large print. That's all I want. So I can select the large print. Oh, maybe I got my settings messed up. Let me, I uh, wonder if it's enabled for this test catalog. All right. Let's see here. Any of them? We go, select right, something first. A catalog that select one of the one. options first, <laughs> Morgan. Just so I can demonstrate. All right. So let me try that again. I'm going to select large print, apply. And if you've made a facet lockable, you'll see the locked icon up here. So that means um, I can lock that in. So if I click the lock icon, that's going to seal it in. And that means I can change my search and search for whatever else I want. So I can search for mystery or you know cookbooks or anything. Um, and that's going to keep my format selection locked in for me until I decide that I want to search for something else and then I can unlock it. So if I was done searching for different things, I could unlock that and then I'd be able to unselect my format choice. So some libraries really love this. Um, I think that patrons who discover it and, and know how to use it really enjoy it. Um, but some libraries are like, no, uh, we'd, we'd rather not. But um, the thing to know about it is if I'm logged in, and I lock a facet, Aspen will remember that for me. So I don't have to keep redoing it every time I come back to the catalog for a new session. Um, you do just have to remember that, you know, if you are ready to search for something else, you would just need to unlock that facet. So that is what that does. It enables that locking ability for you. All right. Um, the, I do want to touch on custom facets really quick. So when you are playing around in your facet settings, you are able to select custom facet one, custom facet two, and custom facet three. Um, but selecting that and giving it a name here doesn't do anything by default. You have to actually set these up. Um, you have to set these up purposefully. And that gets set up in your ILS indexing profile settings. So um, the ILS indexing profile is something that probably only, you know, the, the top level library administrators at your library system or your consortia will have access to. So if that's you, then great. Um, if that's not you, then you may want to get with someone who has that access. Um, so let me show you the back end of how those custom facets get set up. Um, or actually, let me show you some examples first. Uh, so. Cuyahoga has some, a great example. 
And this is actually um, kind of who kind of pioneered this and we developed this for, but other libraries have, have picked it up and done some cool stuff with it. So in their facets, they have two custom facets because they have a very large toy collection. So their facets are, so the age rating is a certain field in their mark records for those toys. And the category of toy is in another, oh, Cuyahoga has their uh, facet counts turned off. <laughs> So that's what that looks like when the numbers are disabled. <laughs> Hooray. I wasn't just making it up, y'all. All right. So um, that's one excellent example of setting up a custom facet. Let me show you uh, Milwaukee County, which is a consortia. And they have a big library of things collection. So they have made a library of things custom facet that's looking at that specific place defined in their records. So um, to do that, you're gonna go to ILS integration in your indexing profile, and that's where you're going to define your custom facets. Uh, you can only have up to three custom facets, and it is consortia wide. So it's server wide. If, if you know each library has their own catalog, you can still only have up to three custom facets. So in the custom facets section, you're gonna define the source. So what place in the record, what field um, are these values going to show? So if I go back to Cuyahoga, um, or actually let me, let me look at the library of things. So I've selected board games and puzzles. So if I go into this record, and go to the staff view to see their mark information, um, they have defined it. So they probably said, all right, all these values for the different library of things categories are in the 655A. So whatever part of the record that's in, um, you wanna take stock of the values that you wanna include in your custom facet. So meaning what do you want to show up as options in this facet? Um, so that might be a good idea to, you know, if you're looking to do something like this, to standardize it. So standardize it by the capitalization and the punctuation because it, it can get real <laughs> specific um, with what values are included. So you get to define the field and what it's including. Um, so in this case, um, we're including everything and we're choosing to exclude certain things. Um, so this is something called regex. Um, it is mysterious and scary. So if you don't know regex, that is okay. Um, but it's highly recommended if you're looking to do something like this, because this is how things can, you know, we can either include specific values or exclude certain values from that field you want to look at for your custom facet. Um, so, of course, if you need help, you know, feel free to put in a support ticket to your support company. Um, so you're basically just defining them. There's custom facet two, custom facet three. <laughs> yes, regis, exactly, Sierra. Regex is scary, perfect for October. Spooky regex. Um, so I'm going to pop under the hood here. Um, hopefully they don't find. Um, so I'm going to go into what this looks like in the back end. Because um, after you define your facets in the ILS indexing profile, um, there's one more step that you'll want to do, and that's in translation maps. So under ILS integration and translation maps, um, you have to define the custom facets. So it's exactly as it is here, custom facet one, custom facet two, without you know the same capitalization and the number. Of course, there's documentation about how to do all of this. Um, so if I go into the custom facet two, this is where you're basically mapping the values that Aspen will find in your records and then showing you know, how you want it to display in the facet options. So this is the code that's in the record. Um, so let me, well, of course that's different for, um, for that's, that's McFlis's. But anyway, so you get the idea. This is what would be in that specified field in your record. And then that's how you want it to display in the facet. 
So that's the last part is you would just want to take stock of all the values you have and then map them according to how you want them to show up in the facet. So I think I pasted it in the chat, but if I didn't, or if Cal already did, I'm just going to paste it again. That will show you how to set up your custom facets. All right, um, let's talk about um, the format categories since we're doing more with format categories these days. So the format categories are, of course, shown above the search results. So the defaults of books, ebooks, audiobooks, et cetera. Um, so if you wanted to change the labels of these, um, you can just, you know, unlike the facets, you know, the availability toggles, you would, you would need to change the labels of these with the translations. So Cuyahoga has actually done that. Um, I think the default for this one is movies, but some libraries have changed it to video or, you know, uh, videos and movies or movies and TV. So if you wanted to do that, um, you would have to enter translation mode in order to do that, and then you'd be able to change the label for that. Um, but, you know, as for how these categories get sorted, um, that is also in your ILS indexing profile. And yeah, Sierra is saying the cautionary tale, um, it will change it in other places. So if you are going to change the label here, just be aware of that possibility. <laughs> um, so don't do it too lightly, <laughs> uh, but you can change it if you, if you want to. No one is gonna stop you. <laughs> so in the ILS indexing profile, um, under format information, this is where you can decide what format goes into what format category. So if you feel like something you know, isn't showing up under the right format category filter in the search results, uh, you might want to check on your format map and see what format category is assigned to that format. Um, the format category also influences the grouping category. So this is actually um, new. I think this was implemented this summer, um, where whenever you select a format category, it's going to automatically show you the corresponding grouping category. So you won't be able to change the grouping category but you, it's going to tell you what the grouping category is based on the format category. So for example, you could have multiple formats, um, you know, audiobooks and books and eBooks, those kind of all get categorized as book. So those are all together. Um, other is, is other, so that's, that's its own category. So that would be like, you know, video games or, you know, library of things stuff. Um, Movies, of course, that could be all your, you know, Blu-rays and DVDs and VHS. Um, so you can see that the grouping category for those is movie. And the newer grouping category that was added was for comic. Um, here we go. So if Aspen detects that the format label um, is comic or graphic novel or manga, that's automatically going to update the grouping category. Um, so there isn't a format category just for comics. That's kind of the, the one exception because you know comics and graphic novels, they're, they're kind of book type things still. Um, but because they have a grouping category of comic, um, we, we don't necessarily want them to group with other books. So that's why we made that change. Um, and that's how you can influence that. And that is, of course, different from the format category. So the format category, that's always going to, um, let me just do a different search. That's always going to be the, the more specific formats. So um, as you have them set up on your format map. So you might have even more granular item types or material types that you're looking at. Um, so you could have like seven different uh, item types that are all mapped to book. You know, if I search for book, um, you know, that could be multiple different things. Book, there's probably more somewhere else, but you get the idea. So you get most granular, you can condense them into similar formats if you want. Um, and then the grouping category is even more broad. Grouping all the book type things with books, grouping all the video type things with other videos, et cetera. 
And speaking of grouping, um, I just wanted to give an overview of grouping again. Um, I know we only have like five minutes left. <laughs> Time goes by so fast. Um, so I wanted to give you an example. Uh, let's do some grouping really quick. So copy this URL. All right, so we're looking at um, this. Oh, wait, actually, I'm going to do this one instead. I think this is a specific library catalog. Yeah, so I'm looking for the lost air. Um, so you can see the, the book records are all grouped together nice and tidy. But if I scroll down, I can see the e-comics are all on their lonesome. And then a little bit further down, we have, you know, there's a lot more in the title of their, um, their record. So it just, the graphic novel didn't necessarily group with the e-comic. Um, comic is a special grouping category too, because I can force this book format to group with the comic. Um, so even if it didn't automatically group, you can still force that to go together. Um, that's the only exception to grouping across different format categories. So if I want to grab, grab, <laughs> group <laughs> this number 13 into number five in the search results here. Oops, let me go back. So I want to group the other one into number five. So I'm going to go back to this. Um, group with. I'm going to select number five. So even though one is a book and the other are e-comics, um, Aspen will still allow because we can make that exception because um, we want those comics to be together. We want the graphic novel to be with the e-comics. So I'm going to hit group. And of course, that's going to, after those records re-index, it will group together. And it will, as usual, make a manual grouping for that. So if I sort by the... Uh, I don't have the ID descending. So it's going to put the most recent thing I've created. So there it is. And it's saying that the grouping category is comic now for all of those things. So let me search for this again. Hopefully I stalled for enough time. All right, not quite enough time. <laughs> um, so if I changed my mind and I no longer wanted those to group together, of course, I could edit that and delete it. And then the next time the records re-index, they would split apart as they normally were before. If you ever want to check the grouping category for something, so if I open up the lost air, just the record. Oh, I think it grouped. All right. So let me search again. Where are you? Did I scroll by it? Here we go. So now we have that group there. Wings of Fire, da 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 um, the book, so it's actually the graphic novel edition of that, is now grouped with the e-comics. So if I ever wanted to verify what Aspen thinks the grouping category of a record is, you would just go into the record. Go down to the staff view. And it will show you there the grouping category. So it's kind of got this alternate titles and authors entry here. So now it's saying, all right, the grouping category for this stuff, we're, we're making it comic now to allow those to stay grouped together. Woo, all right. <laughs> so hopefully I covered some good, juicy, advanced tidbits for you today, um, but we are out of time. So, um, just a reminder that all the documentation is linked from here. Um, some things that I didn't really get to today were cover images. So if you're interested in how to change the cover images, um, definitely look at that because that is pretty useful. There is, um, if you have like one more second, <laughs> I can show you um, an example really quick. So in case it's been a while since you uploaded a custom uh, cover image, I'll just show you real quick before we go. So there's no cover image here, but I wanted to point out that when you go to upload a cover image now, 
you know, you, this this has been around for a bit, but um, in case it's been like a long time, uh, you have the option of whether to apply a cover image to the grouped work or just to an individual record. So since this particular record I'm on is the only one in the grouped work, um, I'm just going to go ahead and paste in a URL here and just apply it to the grouped work because I want it to be representative of everything. And of course, whenever you're uploading cover images, the super secret important <laughs> way to make sure that the image shows up, because this image is cached on my device now. So just remember, when you upload a custom image, you need to do a hard refresh in your browser. So I like to hit shift and then click the refresh button, and that will clear out your cache and get that to show up. So don't forget that. There's other ways to do a hard refresh too or clearing your cache, um, but I, I like to click shift and then the reload button. So just keep in mind the difference there when you're adding that, the difference between the grouped work and the individual record. All right, now I'm done, only two minutes over. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. I hope you have an amazing rest of your day. We will post the recording as soon as we can. And thanks again for being here. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Have Thank a great you. Day.